the steel company. What, what did you install that? Um, who is Steel Kaplan? Uh, these days, Neil Kaplan is whoever he's hired to be. But that is the life of an actor. Uh, I started out, you know, kind of doing voices. Uh, I grew up watching Saturday Night Live. I grew up watching a show that was in the States called um, Copycats when I was a little kid. Frank Horsch was on that. You might have known him as The Ripper. Yeah. But Frank Horsch was an amazing impressions. So I started doing you know, five-year-old impression, so I would do Donald Duck, which was horrible. It was essentially, you know, and, and I had older brothers who teased me, of course, and told me that that was horrible. Little did I know, six weeks later, I would discover how Ducky Nash, the original Donald Duck, would do it. Uh, and then from there, I just started picking up dialects. I started creating vocal characters. When I would do a play, because I came from a stage background, the first thing I would always develop was the voice. And then everything else had to be a characteristic, physically or mentally, that would support that vocal choice. You know? And, I don't know, I started studying uh, drama at the University of Southern California. And then moved to New York City and studied musical theater. Yes, I sing. I don't dance. Don't dance. Maybe. That's a whole different song. Anyway, um, so I went from there and I started doing voiceover in New York City. I did some political ads, I did some political parodies. Uh, I was a drop in morning voice for CBS FM uh, in New York. And I found that that's where I was most comfortable. You know, when I'm on stage, it's like, well, where do I put my hands? And how do I remember all these lines? But when you're doing the voiceover work, you just read it off the page. You know? So that was very gentle on my addling brain and my fairly useless memory. Um, and, and I guess at this point, 20 some odd years later, I'm, I'm, I'm still in the game. Uh, these days, most of my work is, is video game work. Um, I also work kind of steadily on a show called Naruto, which I don't know if anybody's heard of. Cool! Oh, thanks for that. Um, I also have worked on uh, a video game I don't know if any of you are familiar with called StarCraft. There we go, you're the man. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not it, that's me. So, was it the case then that, uh, from a young age, you wanted to be a voice actor? Or was it? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I always had an interest in it. My interest was primarily doing sketch comedy, like Saturday Night Live. But again, even then, there's just, there's so much more freedom for me um, in voiceover, because I can play anyone or anything. I did a series called Digimon. Hey, yeah. And in season it's never like a rock. Um, in season three, I had to play a gentleman by the name of Babel, who, by and by the way, heritage was African American. Now I myself am not African American, but the brilliant thing about voiceover is that it matters. I can play the role, you know. So I played, I played women, I played inanimate objects, I played men, I played. Combinations of all three, you know. And so yeah, I, I wanted to do this certainly since I met Mel Blanc. It was probably about 16 at the time. Yeah, that was a pretty, that was a pretty momentous time in my life. So obviously you're saying that you know you play all of these roles. And I'm just curious, is there any one particular one that stands out that's particularly memorable to you? Is there... Oh, a lot. A lot of them are. are stick out to me. Um, I really enjoy playing Hogman on Digimon. Who's got a fun, you know? And it's actually that boy is right for you in this room, I suppose. Anyway, um, so when I played, when I did Digimon, I actually got cast in Robots in the Sky. 
And so for some reason, people around the world were posting on the internet, oh no, Optimus Prime, it's gonna, and they thought it was going to say, oh no, it's transform! You know? And that was a lot of fun, because as I like to say now, it's kind of my phrase for my career at that time was, Hulk Man Digimon 2! Optimus Prime. And I loved the fact that all these people doubted whether or not I could do it. And so when, when it aired and, and people started saying, hey, he sounds like Peter Cullen. You know? Like, yes, that's right. Um, so what you're telling me is you found doubt on the internet. Oh, I didn't find it out, but doubt found me. <laughs> but it was great because when you know you're going to back it up, then it's not a problem. Then you know you have a surprise to, to spring on people. And that was, that was a pretty momentous occasion, you know, and having people come up and, and telling me that I, I had done uh, I had done well on the role, I had, uh, I had honored what Peter had done before. Uh, that meant a lot to me. At this point in the game, I have to say my favorite character I played, which time is very much not what I've to But that's because, you know, the character was so fully formed and so amazing and had all these wonderful qualities to play. And I also got to work with, you know, best animation director on the planet, Andrea Romano, who, that game is only that good because she was amazing. She made it feel like everybody was in the same room at the same time, and we weren't. And that doesn't work if the director's not snapping everybody right into place. Um, I tend to enjoy everything, you know? I mean, look, I, I've worked on games you guys might have heard of. I worked on a movie called Bioshock Infinite. Uh, thank you. And I had such a blast doing that. It's like I, I went in, and what you do after you audition is they usually will play your audition back after you booked the role because it's been a few weeks or whatever. They didn't have my audition there. And so they, they asked, do you remember what you did? And I told them, no, not really. That was a few weeks ago. But I said, who is the character? And they gave me a quick description. And I basically said, well, with me, you're usually going to get one of two things. You're going to get the 160-pound version of this guy, and it's going to sound along these lines. Or you're going to get the 260-pound version of that guy. And so they said, great, we'll go with guy one here. We'll bring you back on Friday with guy two in a different role. And that's what I love. That's what I love. I, I, I love... Being, I, I did a show called Mouse and the Monster, which you can find on YouTube. It was a hilarious show. It was a blast. But it was so out left field. They didn't know what to do with it, so it was canceled after one year. But I got called in every week to play whatever they needed. And I never knew ahead of time what they were going to use me for. So it was just, I was the utility player. I wasn't one of the leads. I was the background guy. But I was most of the background guy. And that was probably my favorite job I've ever had. Because it was like, oh good. And, and I gotta tell you, I, I live my life uh, as a huge baseball fan, and so you might hear some references to baseball that you may or may not understand, and I apologize for that. But to me, being that guy on that show was like, they could stick me in a shortstop, center field, capture, picture, whatever you guys need, I can do it. And I'm happy to do it. You know, so that. Mouse and the Monster is probably my favorite job I've ever had. Well, we have got uh, microphones out in the wild as well, so if you have any questions uh, for Mr. Kaplan, put your hand over during the course of this, we'll come to you. So the next thing that I would probably want to say, while everybody's sort of jumping their brains trying to ask, how did the role come about? Robots in the Skies. It wasn't a uh, Western produced animated series. No, I was, I was doing some regular work for the folks at Saban. I worked on a TV show. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. There we go. I worked on that show for about seven years. And I was working on Digimon at the time. And they brought a bunch of us in to read for various roles. And I read for x among others. And the description of x was a Southern SUV. Now, I'm thinking to myself, all right, 
southern, that means to have the dialect in later, but an SUV. An SUV in Los Angeles is used like any other car, they just drive on the regular roads. But in the south, they take it off-road. And when you take a 4x4 off-road, you're going to get some rocks kicked up in the undercarriage. And so to me, that's like, well, he's going to be solid, so there you go. But you have to kick up some rocks in the undercarriage, I'm going to stop getting a little bit of texture. And so the, the role, the way I impeached for it, was like this. Hey, man, I'm my name is X, and on my way out, I look into the control booth, and up on the television is a picture of Optimus Prime. And in my head, and this is 2001, but in my head I heard Peter Cullen clear as a bell. And I pointed up the screen and I said, I can do that. Can I read for him? And they said, no, Neil, we got plenty, but thanks. So I never actually auditioned for Optimus Prime. I get a call about a week later from one of the show's directors and producers, and he said, Neil, you know, can you do that thing you did in audition, but without the dialect? It's like, wait, can I do a, a character that I created minus the dialect that I layered on? Yeah, yeah, of course I can. Why? Well, because the producers think you sound like Optimus Prime and they want to cast you in the first episode. They don't have time to audition you, so we're going to record it. And if they like it, they'll air it. So I went in and I recorded the first episode and I told no one. Because I've had situations where I record something and I tell people and for some reason it gets replaced. It, it does happen. They didn't like the performance, there was a technical glitch, whatever it is. So I'm playing at the time in 2001, I'm figuring Optimus Prime visually is probably one of the ten most famous characters around the globe. And I thank you. And I can't tell anybody. But somehow the information leaked out online. It was like, oh no, Armand's playing after his prime. And so they liked it. And they kept it. Oh, sorry, sorry. There's a cardboard Optimus Prime. I have to say hello. Howdy, Prime. Nice to see you. So that's that. That's it. So apparently it was okay because they kept me around for the whole series. I'm guessing situations like that don't come up too often. Then. You just stumble into a movie. It happens. It happens more than you think. Really? My other favorite character, which was uh, which was Tychus Finley, I didn't audition for that either. They brought me in to work on these things called scratch tracks. When they're making a video game or they're doing animation where they record first and animate later. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll have scratch tracks, which is a temporary recording, so they can start doing some of the animation. Alright, so I did the scratch tracks with Titus Finley, and this is when I, I tell people who are StarCraft fans, I, I come out with a horrible admission, and I apologize, because the game StarCraft was delayed about a year because of me. Because what? Yes. You're responsible for it. I am responsible for for StarCraft coming out in 2010 instead of 2009. I apologize. But apparently Tychus was supposed to be a much smaller role. But what I was told by Chris Metzen, the guy who was the godfather of StarCraft. I'm Transformers comic book writer. And Transformers comic book writer, absolutely. Which reminds me, I've got to record his comic for him. Um, but uh, he told me, he said, you know, Tychus was a much smaller character. But then when you recorded it, we heard him. He came to life, and suddenly we, we realized what he needed to be in this game, and what he needed to do, and it was much bigger than they originally wrote, and so it expanded. And that was, that was a great experience, because that was collaboration. That was me looking at the art as developed by Blizzard, and feeling like I had to up my game and get a better performance, and then I would hear from the artists of Blizzard, oh no man, you do your new recordings, and we would have to jack up what we were doing. So it was like this tornado of talent just being inspired by each other, and just getting more and more you know, tighter and better and stronger and, and more powerful. Uh, I think we ended up working on one of the best video games ever. 
certainly if, I mean, the cultural impact of Starcraft around the world, especially in places like Korea, where it's almost, a, it, it is a national sport. It is a national sport, absolutely. And, and my friend Robert Plotworthy, his character, Jim Rayner, put plastered on the side of a Korean Airlines jet and talk about an ego swell. It was like, I'm on a jet. It's okay, I got it. But yes, it's very impressive. And I gotta tell you, look, it's an honor to play Optimus Prime, even for a year. Maybe the opportunity will come back and I'll, I'll, I'll play it again. And if so, they won't have to ask twice. The answer will be yes. Um, but I'm also a personal actor. There are lots of things I'd be more than happy to play anybody. But, you know, you say, Autobots transform and roll out. And people go, oh, that's very nice. That's, that's lovely. But you go up to somebody my age or older, somebody in their 40s, who's a StarCraft player, and I would, and I would say to one of their friends, I'd say, watch his face. Just watch. And I would go up to the guy's ear or the gal's ear, whoever it is in the fan, and I would just say, hey, it's about time. And they would literally melt. They would literally sit there and go, <laughs> it would be this visceral reaction, which is the greatest thing Ever. It's like, you know, wait a second. Like, I'm, I'm supposed to, uh, I'm going to make a phone call a little bit later to uh, a longtime fan and it's their birthday today. And the fact that I can do, I can use my talent, say words, and it makes an impact on somebody's day, and it makes it better, quote unquote, I mean, that's, that's a pretty awesome thing, man. That's, that's pretty cool. You know, so if I walk up to somebody and say, Oh, I got a cool thing. You know? They, exactly, Ray, thank you. Um, you know, so that, that, that's nice. You can say words and make people happy. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Not yet, we'll go on down here. Sprinting up. <laughs> Are they 
respectful when they say it? Are they remembering that I am a human being and I've worked hard in my career and that I have pride in my work and that I have feelings and emotions and maybe when somebody comes up and says, I like Peter Cullen better, that maybe that just might be the littlest bit rude. You know? But some people are rude. And that's what they have to do. Now, on the other hand, if they come up and they're being respectful, they say, I liked what you did, but my favorite is Peter Cullen. I'll say, you know what? He's my favorite, too. Ah, uh, Neil Kaplan is my second favorite Optimus Prime, okay? So I don't blame anybody for saying Peter's their favorite. I, I, I respect that. You know, there are people who like Chris Pine better as Captain Kirk. There are people who like William Shatner better as Captain Kirk. And then there's me, somebody who actually met William Shatner. And got cured of being a trek. Anyway. So, so that's, that's what I say is, does it happen? It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And it, it depends, it depends on how it's said to me. Because I certainly can understand it. Look, I, you know what? There are conventions when I'm here on the stage, and then there are conventions when I'm down there on the floor. I know what it's like to be a fan. I really do, and I get it. You know, as I said, I'm a Giants, I'm a baseball fan, I'm a Giants fan. Two-time World Series champions the last three years. <laughs> anyway, but some of my favorite players were from the 80s. Will Clark, Kevin Mitchell, they weren't on the championship team. Maybe I'm more interested in meeting Will Clark than I am in meeting, you know, Brandon Belt. But that's okay. Everybody's got tastes, everybody's got likes and dislikes. And, you know? Gotta let people be people. That's all. But thanks. I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Rebecca. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I was actually just wondering uh, when you do voice over like that, uh, do are other voice actors with you, and do you have any like. Uh, Memories, fond memories of how you did voiceovers together and stuff like that. I gotta tell you, most of the stuff I do are video games and anime, and they are usually recorded separately. Uh, I was more about the uh, Robots in the Skies. Uh, I'm Robots in the Skies was his anime, so I recorded solo. So there was. Look, when I was doing Robots in Disguise, do you guys know there were two different directors on the show? You guys have watched the DVDs? You got them? Well, this is the thing, Rebecca. There were two directors on that show. One director had never seen Transformers before. So, he would usually, again, he had a face mask. So I could add words. And he would add words in the script. To make up in this Brian Younger and a bit more of a gun ho. All right, all of us, let's get out there. You know, that sort of a thing. Whereas the other director, Michael McConaughey, had worked on G1. So he had experience working with Peter Cullen, and he directed a be more like Peter Cullen. So he would take words out of the script. And give me fewer things to say. And tend to tell me, all right, remember, you're playing an you're playing a giant metallic version of John Wayne. Because that's what Peter Collins was doing back in 1983. So anyway, that's what I did. And I did what the directors told me to do. So if you go back and watch the DVDs with that week, you'll notice there are some episodes like this. Those are Steve Kramer episodes. And then there are some episodes like this. That, those are McConaughey episodes. Then he meets takes every now and then, for some reason one day I basically said, Optimus, Optimus Prime, transform! And on that day, Optimus was born. And then you can't do it, you know, do it like this every now and then. Ooh, we better get it right from Faith Ridge. You know, you know, yes, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, we've got a Moss little boy named Corey Quinn at the control. No, not Moss anymore. I can oh, tell yeah. Saved. Well, that's all right. He was right. 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 So, so it's Amber Alert. Nice. 
Uh, but uh, so that was a lot of fun. My most fun, I would have to say, was when I was working on um, when I was working on the Mouse and the Monster because I was working with some actors that I really admired. You know, who uh, had done character work in TV and movies for years and years and years. And we were all in the room together, and we would riff. You know, and, and that's that's a blast. When you get to record with other actors, when you're doing original animation, that's just great. You know, otherwise you're isolated. It's like being in a phone booth, and you're doing voices to yourself. So you never know how how it's being received. It's not like you're you're being in front of other actors. You see them smile, or you see them chuckle, and you go, "Oh, that worked." You know, so. Uh, let's see, there's also somebody in the back. Uh, did that answer your question, though? Cool, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, well, I sort of want to hear more about that uh, William Shatner story, but that's... <laughs> I'll tell you really quickly. Walter Koenig invited me on the set of Star Trek IV in 1986. Um, and I went and bought a poster because I looked through all of my collection and there was not a single picture that had everybody in it. And Kirk and Spock and Chekhov was in it, Sulu wasn't. If Sulu and Ahura and Chekhov were in it, then McCoy was missing. I was like, this won't work. So I went to a place called Hollywood Posters and uh, looked through all of their posters and I found one that was an Australian release poster for Star Trek III. And it had eight by tens of all of the actors all the way around and then the logo on the set. So I bought that movie to the set. Unfortunately, on that day, it was one of the days they were filming on the Klingon Bird of Prey. Uh, and, uh, and so that meant that, uh, that DeForest Kelly and Jimmy Doolin were not there that day. Because if you remember, they spent most of their time down taking care of the whales. You know, I am a truck nerd. Um, I know these things. Yes, of course. That was a movie in which they went to San Francisco. Um, so anywho... I get Walter to sign the poster, I get George to sign the poster, I get Michelle to sign the poster. This guy comes over and he says to Michelle Nichols, I remember the day I took that picture of you, Michelle. And everybody's enjoying it. Oh, this is a nice poster. Where is it from? I've never seen it. I'm telling stories. And then it's come time for me to leave. And Nimoy and Shatner are coming off the set. And I walk up, poster in one hand, pen in the other. And William Shatner reaches out, takes me by the shoulders, turns me around, and pushed me away. And as I told people, if I ever, ever, ever behave like that to a fan of mine, you officially have my permission to punch me in the head. Okay? Because I don't think, it's not like I was interrupting his breakfast. I was obviously a news, I was a guest on that set of the movie. The movie, which, by the way, I was nerdy enough in 1978 to write letters to Paramount and say, Star Wars is nice, but we need a Star Trek movie. I was one of those people. And he did that. Never again. And let me tell you, a few years later, about a decade and a half later, I'm at my agent's office, and I go downstairs, and there's a recording studio right next door. And he comes walking out. And I see it. And I say, you're going to boss the legal. <laughs> oh! Oh! The nerd fan took over again. I have a chance to say, you killed the trek inside. But no! You, <laughs> All right, so anyway, just so you know, there is a gentleman in the last row that's had his hand up for I know, after this thing. Yeah, because he's big. I mean, I'm not going to say no to him. Yeah, I know. What do you got, guns? <laughs> I mean, maybe a lost story. Lost yes? Story. Lost story. Lost story. Lost story. Lost story. Lost story. Lost story. I'm doing a point of the show. It's really nice. And I would like to do this stuff. All right. And it's all that lines. Why don't you come over to my table later and we'll talk about it. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to say, great. Okay, all right, all right. We'll talk later. We'll figure it out. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much.
Cheers. <laughs>
podcast. It's called Nerdguments with Neil Kaplan. It's on iTunes. And we basically, I basically talk to creative people and ask about what turns them into a fanboy. Yeah. You know? And then talk to documentarians and writers and directors and voiceover people. You know? I don't want to keep going to voiceover people, though, because, you know, that's... You know, that's Rob Paulson's thing, and he does a brilliant job of talking to us. But yes, yesterday I just put up an interview with Rob Paulson. Yeah, that was, a, that was a lot of fun to record. We had a blast. My favorite that I've done was probably Chris Benson, you know, the Transformer comic book writer. <laughs> but that was a lot of fun. Thank you for bringing that up. Did you want to know something? No, 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 it was just more some of the inspiration behind it. Was it? Your, um, how best to phrase it? The fact that you're a fan, you just want yeah. to share in the deep. Yeah, no, it's definitely about, you know, you start seeing the passion that comes into people. And the fact of it is that people are fans of lots of different things, right? Sometimes it's food, sometimes it's politics, sometimes it's sports. And we're fans to the point that we will nerd you. About, you know, look, one of my nerd units that I used to throw out there was, look, no, no disrespect to any other Optimus Primes, but, you know, when they weren't saving the planet, they were like delivering stereo equipment. Alright? When you're playing a, when you're playing a, a fire truck version, he was a full time hero. You know, and then you get into discussions and people say, no, but you know, what you don't understand is, and you start getting into those details. You know, like a nerd unit, for instance, would be, the difference in the robots. In the original series, it was just giant robot transforming a vehicle, that's it. But for the movie, they felt the need to have it mechanically work, to have somebody be able to look at the transformation and see all the different parts. And that's a pretty nerdy thing. But I want it. It's the details, you know? And so it's people talking about their favorite picture. It's people talking about why they prefer to use honey versus versus sugar when they're cooking. I mean, we all get nerdy about something, you know? And so that's what I love about it, is being able to talk to people about what really gets them going, what really jazzes them, you know? So just to push that nerdy button, what is your favorite Star Trek movie? My favorite Trek movie is probably two. Save the planet. 
protecting humans. You know, whereas Megatron gets to destroy the planet and enjoy himself. By the way, I was the first actor to play both Megatron and Optimus Prime. There was only one line as Megatron, but still I played it! Anyway, do we are we gonna are we gonna show the, the pilot? Yeah, Let's see what it's 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 And then if you got any questions afterwards. The title of the episode is
Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Neil Kaplan is going to be available. Uh, oh, he's tucked away in the corner. Yes, yeah, tucked away in the corner there, so he's all safe and cooking. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you've got any questions, feel free to go up and ask him, get things signed, uh, and he'll be joining us later on uh, on the weekend up on stage. And he'll be joining us tonight for us. Yes, yeah. sure. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click on the like button and leave us a comment below. Also, spare a moment to share this video on Twitter, Facebook and all your social media pages. To get updates on all of our latest videos delivered straight to your inbox, subscribe now using the link on the screen.